McGrath. The burn fried me mentally and destroyed me physically. Without a snow cushion for the sled jarring, the jarring of the ground was brutal, like downhill skiing in bad moguls for 36 hours straight. My legs were in agony, and I had started to bleed anally from hemorrhoids, which were to get worse and lead me to buy sanitary napkins in the store in McGrath and wear them the rest of the race. I left the collection of huts that was Nikolai in midday, after sitting on the sled in the sun all morning, resting the dogs. Out in the wind it had been cold, but with such a building in back of the sled to block the wind and the sun heating down, it was positively warm, about zero, and I lay back and baked. At the start of the race, day and night were split almost evenly, but daylight was gaining by 17 minutes each day, so we'd picked up another hour and a half of daylight, and I took advantage of every minute of relaxing warmth I could. As a matter of fact, I would have stayed longer except that the race intervened. Against all precautions, my own very definitely included, I was not running last. Somehow, I was right running in the high 30s out of 70 teams. I was in no way competitive and knew it, and in fact I had very serious doubts that I would finish. But I wasn't running last, and so while one part of me wanted to lie in the sun and relax, every time a team hooked up and left I would feel the urge to do the same. At length, when the third team pulled out, I said to L with it, and hooked up the tugs and we ran to McGrath. The run over was a textbook trip. The dogs ran flawlessly. It is all river running, or nearly so, and consequently flat and easy going. At one point after dark, we entered a section of the river where it wound back and forth so much it was possible to run a mile but move forward only a hundred yards. I could see the lights of McGrath on the horizon, and they seemed so close I could touch them, yet we didn't get there for four more hours until after dawn. I was fast becoming a connoisseur of checkpoints. Finger Lake was not so good. It seemed disorganized. Rainy Pass Lodge and Ron River were both better. Nikolai seemed less organized. I paused after pulling up into town off the river ice. Within moments, a checker came out of the building and signed me in and out, and pointed out to where the food sacks were and I, where I could rest my team. All in a minute or less. I put the team down to rest and went to get my food from a pile next to a large store. I was walking back to the team with the sacks, past the front of a cafe building next to the store, when somebody opened the door of the cafe and the smell that came out stopped me dead. It was so strange, a hunger of such intensity that my mind seemed consumed by it, like being in love. I had been eating poorly, oft often not at all. A meat patty here and there, but I had been driven by such excitement that hunger simply hadn't been a factor. Now it was absolutely riveting hunger so vicious that I could think of nothing else. A meal, a sit-down hot meal became the only thing in my mind. I put down the food sacks and walked into the cafe. It was a narrow building with a counter and stools down the right side. Still in full gear. Skill, still in full arctic gear, parka, wind pants, down pants, mukhlas, inner gloves, second gloves, full sheepskin mitts. I sat at one of the stools. There's a picture. I just lost my place. There's a picture of it I wanted to find. Um, This one. Got at one of the stools. Would you like something to eat? A waitress came up to me. I took a menu from a li little rack and opened it. Anything. 
I jabbed with a mitted hand. Here. This. Ham and eggs, she said. And would you like coffee? Barrels of it, please. She gave my order to a man at the rear who was cooking and I simply sat staring at the menu, marveling at all the wonderful things on it. You can take your gear off, she said when she brought the coffee. She was smiling. We have a heater in here. What? Oh. I nodded. I just forgot for a minute. I shucked out of my parka mittens and unzipped the sides of my down pants to open them and let the warm air in. I sipped the coffee, holding the cup in hands almost indescribably filthy. My beard was full of ice as well, and I felt it drip as it melted. There was a brief second of hesitation when the plate came in. Two eggs, yellow yolks up, a good slab of ham, and a pile of hash browns so that I could appreciate how wonderful it all looked. Then I inhaled it, almost literally. I remember seeing the plate, and I remember eating using a fork or knife, but not individual actions. Everything just seemed to disappear, and when it was done, the waitress stood up in front of me. Goodness, she said. That was quick. Do you want more? I looked at her, and I must have nodded, because she vanished and was back shortly with another plate, just like the last, ham, eggs, and hash browns. And again I seemed to swallow it whole, and once more she stood in front of me and smiled. Still hungry? I looked at the plate up at her and said nothing, but she nodded and turned away. Five times. I sat there and ate five complete ham and egg breakfasts without pause, ate them, and when I was done still felt hungry, but stopped in embarrassment. As I stood to pay at the end of the counter, the cook came out of the rear. He was a burly man who could have doubled for the cook in the Beetle Bailey strip. The bill was horrendous, sixty or seventy dollars. Alaska interior prices had kicked in. Every egg, every piece of food, it, food in the breakfast had to be flown in by bush plane. And I was and I was digging for money. He held up a held up a hand. Aren't you one of the mushers? I nodded. Then your money is no good. Have a good run. And he wouldn't. No matter how I tried, he wouldn't take the money. I finally left some on the counter for the waitress and went out to the dogs. And many times later on that run, I would remember eating those five breakfasts sitting in the cafe in McGrath while my beard ice melted and dripped.